Evening, everybody. Uh, the level's okay? Good? Wonderful. So, yeah, ruminants, humanity and ruminants, past, present, and future. Um, I was kind of proud of those pictures. Um, so the short version is that there would be no modern human beings as a species without ruminants. Uh, modern societies depend upon ruminant animal agriculture in some form, and that's global. Um, and that if we're going to meet the needs of mid-century world, we must improve the productivity and efficiency of ruminant animal agriculture. Um, and, you know, it's always important to remind myself that there's no such thing as a point of view that's nobody's point of view. <laughs> so show me a man without a point of view, I'll show you a corpse. So let me show you my point of view. Um, and for those of you who are new to forage agriculture, this is not how we test hay. <laughs> there is no test it, tasting section of the testing. Um, I'm an advocate for therapeutic carbohydrate reduction and ruminant animal agriculture, and I'm gifted with the opportunity to go, as was mentioned, many, many places and try to spread the good news on both sides of that. Um, I've worked in forage agriculture most of my adult life. I currently work for a seed company, but I'm not here in any capacity as a representative for that company. So that's a bit of where I'm coming from, but a bit more as an agronomist. I'm trained in those sciences that deal with healthy soils and healthy plants. As a ruminant nutritionist, I'm trained in a functional discipline called nutrition. Sorry, couldn't resist. Uh, and so, you know, the tie between forage crops and ruminants, pretty clear. And then, as was mentioned, I've had my own personal health experience. Um, and that led me to dive pretty deeply into the subject. And I feel pretty comfortable operating in that space. Um, and again, it's my personal experience, so I have a bit of a bias. Uh, in 2007, I was a 52-year-old balding, obese, pre-diabetic. Today, I'm just balding. <laughs> so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, one of the messages I want people to take from this, and I want more people to understand and value, is that when you improve your health, you are improving the world. I think there are messages and conversations about that don't put sufficient value on that. Um, and, and in many cases, it's the most practical thing we can do to improve the world, right? Um, and there's lots of ways we could talk about that. Um, I do believe butter, meat, and cheese belong in a healthy diet. Um, and those are all the products of ruminant animal agriculture, which means that they're all the products of forage agriculture. And we'll talk about that today, tonight, and then again tomorrow, I'll focus a bit more on forage agriculture. So here is where I, you know, kind of come up with a deep, dark secret, and I confess that in this case, I agree with Dean Ornish. <sighs> Don't hate me. Um, what's good for you is good for the planet. Um, so uh, while we can agree with the statement, I suspect we're going to differ on the details, which is really important for us to get because in this conversation space, we need to make sure we know what people are talking about. Like nutrient dense has an official definition. And I know that many of the people that use that phrase don't aren't using it in the sense that the official definition, right? So, okay, good enough, more. Um, why did I put this slide right after the Dean Ornish quote? <laughs> um, and, and yes, it's a plant-based beef patty. Um, <laughs> Um, remember the phrase male bovine fecal matter. It'll come in really handy. You can use it at parties. <laughs> use it at church. Um, 
again, second take-home message. Well, so the point with the previous slide is you just deal with the same thing again and again and again, and people just say stuff. And anymore, I don't think they're even trying. They just spray stuff out there, and then you've got to respond to it. So one of the efforts that I have is I'm recruiting for what I call the Ruminati. Yes. <laughs> and these are... <laughs> And these are people that understand the essential role that ruminants play in ecosystems, the essential role of ruminant animal agriculture, the essential role of ruminant animal products in human health and flourishing. I happen to be the sod father of the ruminati. (laughs) Thank you for coming. Um, And so second take-home message to those people who are restoring their mental and physical health on an omnivorous diet, on a diet largely based on animal source food. I know people who are solely animal source food. Please don't listen to the voices that advocated it for the diet that made you sick in the first place. And, and there's, a long, there's a long story. There's been great books written. I'm happy to go off on that. But really, 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 a lot of these messages have been combined for a very long time. And, and if we don't recognize that when we engage in the conversation, we may not make much progress because it really isn't. that They've got another agenda and they've got another thing that they're driving to. So... I'd really like to get past diet wars. I'd really like to stop fighting. I'd just like to see if we can't find some common ground here because we've got a big challenge in front of us. And I think most of this other stuff is just distraction. Um, And I think that distraction is on purpose. Um, So could we agree on focusing on achieving adequate essential nutrition and focus on metabolic health. I understand that there's then conversations that flow from that, but if we run into somebody who doesn't agree with those, then we know really, do we really need to have a conversation? Uh, Who would argue against adequate essential nutrition? Who would argue against metabolic health? Unfortunately, I don't think we've been well informed over the years. And so there's going to have to be an educational effort behind those. But then I want people to have the freedom to choose appropriately once they're adequately informed. Okay. Um, And again, us and them. I come from agriculture. That's my training and background. I get to stand between my agricultural tribes and my nutrition tribes. And I want to introduce them to each other. I want us to speak with each other. Um, Consumers and producers alike care about animal welfare, environmental stewardship, food safety, nutrition, and taste. It may be that we have different perspectives on those. cultural reference here, and I'm sorry if anyone doesn't get it, but the matrix, do I have to explain that? I don't. So the, the, the hero, his name was Neo, is that right? Neo was offered the opportunity, having been given a glimpse of what reality really was, he was given the opportunity he could take the blue pill and go back to life as he knew it, forget everything he had just seen, you know, whatever. Um... So my version of this is take the blue pill. You'll continue to believe your received narratives and worldviews regarding diet, health, nutrition, agriculture, and the environment. A life of diminished vitality, chronic illness, and medication awaits. Or you can take the red pill, enter the world of true lifestyle medicine, and we will show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. A life of new possibility awaits you and billions of others. And it literally is billions. This is a global thing that we could be engaged in if we could get past some of the stuff that distracts us. Um, and, And here's where you need to be careful because I think lifestyle medicine has been patented by somebody. 
and lifestyle medicine is coming at us from Coca-Cola and Seventh-day Adventists. Um, so let me introduce you to a world. All right, here's a pill. Let me introduce you to a world where one egg a day can grow a better human brain. There is a community of people that are doing this kind of work globally. And if we can get a pregnant woman to eat one egg a day in addition to whatever her diet is, and then while she's breastfeeding, we can then measure cognitive and scholastic performance differences in that child compared to children from that community that didn't get that intervention. We can do this, but we've got to get past people who say, but not animal source food. Part of this, again, is getting us to see the world as it is. So here's, sorry, they warned you that there would be some tests, right? <laughs> so here's the first one. There are 2 billion children in the world today, 0 to 15 years old. There's about 7, 7.5 billion people in the world today. Okay, so how many children of that age will there be in the year 2100? when the estimate is 10 billion. Those numbers vary. Four, three, two, I've already heard the number, it's 2 billion. Same number of children. So the next time you hear somebody confidently bloviating about how we must do something about population growth, ask them, what exactly are you proposing? Because what's going to happen is the old farts like me get to get older in places like Africa and Asia. So what exactly are you proposing? There's no more children. Same number of children. So you're saying Africans and Asians should die, shouldn't live as long as they could? That, that, that really? <laughs> could I get you on record as saying that? Because... That's remarkable, but again, I think people don't know, and so they say things. I think some people do know, and they say it, and that's a whole other category. If you're not familiar with this book uh, or with Hans Rosling, I recommend he's got a lot of talks that he did. He spoke at Google. A lot of his talks are on YouTube. This particular book was published posthumously by his son and daughter-in-law, Factfulness. Uh, 10 reasons we're wrong about the world and why things are better than you think. Um, but there are things that, again, need to be addressed. 2 billion people in the world out of that 7.5 billion have micronutrient malnutrition. Stunted mothers more likely to have stunted children. <sighs> Of the deaths, 45% of deaths are caused by undernutrition in children under five. 80% of cases of stunting and wasting in under five-year-olds are in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Two billion people suffer micronutrient deficiencies. 150-some million children under five suffer from stunting, millions more have impaired cognitive development related to poor nutrition, partly due to insufficient consumption of animal source food. Animal source foods supply multiple bioavailable nutrients that are often lacking in cereal-based diets of the poor. Anybody remember Eat Lancet? That would be the cereal-based diets that they're recommending. Um, so when it comes to consumption of animal source food, there is such a thing as too little. Period. Full stop. That should not be a matter of debate. It's established. <sighs> too many people still believe there's such a thing as too much. And so part of my mission is to see what would it take for you to feel like you didn't have to say that anymore in some of these papers that have been coming out recently, where they'll talk confidently about avoiding stunting, but then, but not too much. And I'll show you an example of that. So my statement, the preponderance of evidence from all scientific disciplines strongly suggests that the most likely harm associated with meat consumption is from not consuming enough. <laughs> we should, uh, here's an aspirational goal. I, I suggest 
I would offer this. We should all strive against the generation and propagation of unnecessary human suffering and pain. We're human. We're going to suffer. We're going to experience pain. But that creation of unnecessary suffering and pain. And, and there's just so much stuff going on. Death is inevitable, but a life of protracted ill health is not. Chronic disease prevention and control helps people to live longer and healthier lives. Non-communicable diseases are the biggest cause of death globally by a long shot. In the United States, something like less than 90, just, just well, what is it? 12% of adult Americans don't enjoy optimal metabolic health. 12, sorry, 12%, only 12%, rewind, only 12% of adult Americans enjoy optimal metabolic health. Sorry, yeah. Okay, 60% of adult Americans have one or more chronic illnesses. And well over 50% have diabetes or prediabetes. And that's using a bad metric. The number's much higher. So you can tell when idols are being worshipped because human beings are being sacrificed. Some of, these, some of these idols we're quite familiar with, and we often approve of them. So it's a challenge to us. I mean, we shouldn't feel overly comfortable with ourselves, right? There's, there's lots of ways that this comes out. Um, but, you know, we, we, <laughs> there's so much that could be done, and we're so distracted, and uh, I'll get to some of that stuff coming up. Again, my perspective, I'm trained as an agronomist. I learned this in soil fertility, Liebig's barrel, Justus von Liebig. He was the first organic chemist. He had a role to play in soil fertility. And his idea, and you can apply this, and I'm going to apply it to public health, you can apply it to any biological system. Something is always going to be limiting that system. Okay? In this case, you know, we've got, depending on your taste, it could be a you know, a wine barrel or a water barrel, you know, a rain barrel. You've got wooden staves of different length. The volume, the amount of wine or water that barrel can hold is going to be set by the shortest stave. I can increase the length of all those other staves. It's not going to hold anymore. I have to, I have to accurately identify what's limiting and address it. Okay, in this case, it was phosphorus. So I apply phosphorus, and now that stave is no longer limiting, now nitrogen is limiting, okay? And so on and so on and so on until I get to a point where maybe it's sunlight and I'm dealing with field crop production. There's nothing I'm going to do about sunlight. Or it could be heat, similar sorts of things. So you reach some maximum that you can't go beyond. Okay, so I'm going to take that model and I'm going to apply it to human health. And the limiting stave, I am convinced, is chronically elevated insulin, hyperinsulinemia. Okay, so insulin deficiency, excess carbohydrate, many other factors. You can, I'm also convinced that we have a protein deficiency, and I'll talk about that coming. Then you can think about other nutrient deficiencies, imbalances, or lack of essential fatty acids. We've had people, how many women have chronically been on semi-starvation diets since their teens? I bet that has an effect. Um, other lifestyle factors, right? Um, diet isn't the only thing. I mean, genetics does load the gun and yeah, lifestyle pulls the trigger, right? So there's lots of things that we could or be looking at at the same time. But we're just going to look at, at this. And again, this is one paper where the, the question was asked in the title, hyperinsulinemia, a unifying theory of chronic disease, question mark. This paper came out in 2015. And as I look down that list, that's a pretty significant list of chronic diseases. Uh, cancer, circulatory, gastrointestinal, endocrine, nervous, skeletal, urinary. What all I'm saying here is this is such a strong signal that unless we've somehow taken care of this, the likelihood that we could accurately perceive any other signal is very small. 
It's just how I was trained. It's my background. It's my approach. So let's get this sorted, and then undoubtedly we'll see other things come, and let's deal with those as we go. But when we've got only 12% of adult Americans enjoying optimal metabolic health, which is driven by this condition, when less than a third of normal weight adult Americans enjoy optimal metabolic health, we've been driving for really bad metrics. Uh, it's, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, so the greatest wealth is health. And I make the point that we can have healthy soil and healthy people thanks to ruminants. Okay, so that's a big part of what I try to do. We need to accept the fact that as heterotrophic organisms, something's got to die if we're going to live. We have to consume other organisms, plant or animal or fungi, right? But, right? So that, that's our, we can't go out and photosynthesize, no matter how good the day was today, and it was glorious. Mid-November, and this is real nice. Um, so let's talk about what are ruminants, what role did they play? Oh, please, no, 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 no. You're going to wait at least an hour. Um, oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, what role did they play in humanity's past? Why are they essential today? And how will they enable a truly sustainable future? So here's your next quiz. Which mammals are designed to digest a low-fat diet? You've got group A, which has sheep and cattle, which are both ruminants. Then you've got a mountain gorilla, which is not. That's group A. Group B is modern human beings, lions, polar bears. How many people think that group A is the group of mammals designed to digest a low-fat diet? Okay, how many people think it's group B? How many people have heard me before and strongly suspect a trick question? <laughs> yeah, there's a difference between digest and ingest. Ah, you got to watch these people. <laughs> watch the words. So clearly, group A is designed to ingest a low-fat diet. A ruminant can't be ingesting more than about 5-6% fat in its ration. Okay, high fiber, low quality protein, right? But thanks to the rumen, it ends up getting 70 to 80% of its energy coming from fat, which is formed in the microbial fermentation within its rumen, the fermentation of the fiber. Um, so 134 species of ruminants, about 21 of those have been domesticated. Ruminants are not competitive with humans regardless of the management system. And I'll show you some data. Increase, they actually increase the food supply and improve the food quality for humanity. And they provoke, sorry? Totally random question. What kind of cow is that on the bottom? It's like pretty cool. Oh, the, this one? This is actually a buffalo. A buffalo? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a tropical. So humanity has domesticated ruminants in every eco zone that they've successfully colonized. Pardon? Yeah, pinkish. No, uh, not really. Just a very close coat. Um, and again, I didn't take the picture. I didn't see the animal. Um, so ruminants, you know, they're they're mammals. Even toes, they uh, chew a cud, they can have horns, or they can have antlers, or they can have neither. Um, four stomachs, we say four stomachs, the rumen and reticulum are really two regions of the same big structure. Um, that's the big fermentation vat that we plug in front of what's otherwise a simple stomach system within this omasum in between that's used to absorb um, liquid and some minerals before the ingesta goes down into the acid stomach. There's a range of these animals. They have a, a, a range of dietary preference. Some are better adapted at eating grass, which is a lower quality feed. Others prefer browse, which has a higher feed value. Uh, so they have different mouth structure. They have different feeding patterns, um, but they're all basically going to take the, the fixed, the primary carbohydrate in the biosphere is cellulose. And no vertebrate organism makes the cellulase enzyme that breaks down that, that, mo that polymer of glucose units to liberate that energy. And so 
we're entirely dependent on microorganisms, either free living in the environment or within ruminants, to break that down, to make that fixed CO2 available to us as an energy source. Um, of all the animals that have been domesticated, about 47 species, 21 of them are ruminants. Um, yeah, it's pretty tricky to domesticate a carnivore, I guess. Um, <laughs> And you need to be suspicious of those omnivores, you know. Um, so here's, if, you are not what you eat, right? Just stop that. You're what your body does with what you eat. And here's my handy reference on that. Um, so that's high fiber, low fat, low protein, and it's poor quality protein. And these aren't. You know, they're low in fiber, they're high fat, and they're high protein, and it's highest quality. <clears throat> Again, I mentioned this difference between simple stomach organisms like a pig, like us. Sorry to make the comparison. <clears throat> We've got three macronutrients flowing in in the diet. We've got protein, carbohydrate, and fat. Acidic environment with some enzymes, then it flows into the intestine where more enzymes and then from the, the intestines, we absorb simple sugars, amino acids, and fatty acids, right? <sighs> Ruminants, as I said, we, we plug in this big anaerobic fermentation vat at the beginning. And then we have this rechewing process called rumination. So we physically break it down, and then we also have the microbial activity to break down that fibrous material until it's small enough to pass out. But we also produce methane, volatile fatty acids, and ammonia as byproducts of that rumen fermentation process. The, the methane gets burped out. We'll talk about that. The volatile fatty acids are what's absorbed through the rumen wall, and 70 to 80 percent of our energy ends up coming from those volatile fatty acids. <clears throat> and then if we have too much ammonia being evolved, then that's a metabolic drain because that has to be excreted as urea. Once that material can pass down through into the acidic, basically we're culturing untold billions of microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and then the host animal harvests them. So it's they're a wonderfully delicate system. Um, so either call us microbivores or microbians, they're not vegetarians. Again, I mentioned the difference between ingestion and digestion. Low-fat diet leads to a high amount of fat being produced in microbial fermentation. <sighs> so why ruminants rule? If you like eating plants, if you enjoy it, and if they're good with you, because plants aren't our friends, some people have real problems with various plant foods, and you should feel comfortable in not eating them, okay? Um, which, if you don't eat them, you might be more comfortable. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there's only two proper uses of kale. <laughs> One is as a garnish, and the other is as a forage crop, which we can use quite nicely. It's very effective for filling periods of pasture growth deficit. So there's this wonderful ecological fit between ruminants and human beings. Humans have essential amino acids, right? There's no such thing as an essential amino acid in a ruminant's diet. So not all of the nitrogen, not all of... So, yeah, I'll get to this in a second. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, there are essential fatty acids in the human diet. There's no such thing as an essential uh, fatty acid in a ruminant's diet. There's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate in human diet. There are two forms that are essential for proper rumen function. You need both structural fiber and non-structural, that would be sugar and starch. You have to have both in order for the rumen to function properly. And so, you know, balance is key like it is in so many things. So 
ruminants turn carbohydrates into fat for us instead of us, which I think is a wonderful deal. Um, <clears throat> the essential ecological function of ruminants via that anaerobic microbial fermentation of resources that are inedible by humans. Key point. And that can be pasture, rangeland, or it can be plant residue. It can be byproducts from crops that we are growing for human consumption. So it's not an either or thing, but in any case, they convert the structural, non-structural carbohydrates into fat. They convert plant protein, I put that in quotes, and I'll get to it in a second, and non-protein nitrogen into high quality animal protein that's balanced in its amino acid composition, meeting our needs. <clears throat> it reduces unstable polyunsaturated fatty acids <clears throat> to monounsaturated and more stable saturated fatty acids through a process called biohydrogenation. So I said 5 to 6% was maximum fat in the diet. If too much of that is polyunsaturated fat, the number gets less because apparently those polyunsaturated fatty acids are more toxic to the rumen organisms than our other fatty acids, which I find interesting. Um, they produce vitamin B12, other vitamins, increase bioavailability of essential minerals, right? Degrade anti-quality plant components like phytates and other compounds, secondary metabolites. <sighs> Maintain health of grassland ecosystems, which are our largest terrestrial biomes. Uh, if you don't graze or burn grassland, it declines in quality. I'd rather graze it. Um, maintain, um, recycle nutrient, build soil health, provide services like draft, byproducts like leather, generate new wealth. So you talk about draft and you think this is just some old stuff. Some half of the farmers in the world today still depend on draft animals. And a significant number of those are ruminants. So people who are talking about getting rid of animal agriculture, what exactly are you proposing here? Oh, more tractors. Oh, sure, no problem there. <sighs> yeah, still essential for crop production. So even, we're just talking crop production. With, without livestock, you don't get it, right? 15% of farms in Southern Africa, 81% in Northern Africa depend on traction. 7 million oxen are the main source of power for tilling soil in Ethiopian highlands. Again, the world that we live in, we've got a billion people that don't have access to electricity, which means that nothing that we take for granted have they gotten to experience yet. This woman has a plate of dung on her shoulder. Those pats against the wall are pats of dung drying so she can burn them later for fuel. We've got three billion people who rely on dirty biomass fuels like charcoal, coal, and dung for cooking. And a significant cause of childhood death and respiratory disease is the particulates from those dirty fuel systems. We've got real work that we can be doing and we're being distracted by other stuff. And I just, okay, economics, clearly ruminants are a significant source of new wealth generation every year. Um, buffalo meat, um, $9 billion a year, who knew? Um, so out of the 760-some million people living in extreme poverty, half of them are pastoralists or smallholders or workers relying on livestock for food and livelihoods. So when people start mucking about with policy and development goals, these people get impacted. I'd like to see that not happen. So ruminant agriculture, I make the point, is the only truly... Is the, is the truly sustainable form of agriculture. And again, when you improve your health, you are improving the world. Um, again, I explained how the, ruminant pro, the rumen digestive system is a fermentation process. So I have a new campaign I'm launching here that... <laughs> these are all different forms of fermented plant products. So 
Let's just get everybody happy here, right? Just, uh, I don't care if you like, you know, lamb or goat or beef or venison or buffalo, uh, bison. Um, so a bit on the past, our past relationship. I learned about this uh, painting from um, uh, anthropologist Dr. Aiello. She's associated with uh, the expensive gut hypothesis, the theory that hum- humanity was able to exchange the metabolic energy necessary to maintain a large gut, got rid of that because it... We, ancestors started exploiting higher value feed source. So you don't need the expensive gut. That could fuel the brain development. Plus you're eating all that you need to make a good brain. Okay, so she talked about this. Uh, Two mothers is the, the translation of the title. And prehistoric woman mother shields her two children against a wild beast hunting for food for her offspring. And you can just barely see this dark here menacing form in the background. Um, Dr. Aiello says she has this on the wall of her office to remind her what a bad day really is. (laughs) Um, And so here we have a woman. She's got, you know, one young child. She's got an infant. It's still in arms, and she may be pregnant for all we know. So... We are her grandchildren, right? So it might be wise to look at some of that ancestral experience, Um, maybe a little gratitude from time to time. Um, Roger Kipling, the cat who walked by himself, other stories, uh, the just so stories. I don't know if anybody else came across these. So this this is the story of the naming of the animals. And now we've got man has, man, this is, this is his allegory of the domestication of animals. And so man has brought woman into his cave and she promptly domesticated him. Um, and then proceeds to bring in animals. Uh, and so now the third one comes. And so, uh, man has come back from hunting and finds cow. Uh, her name is not Wild Cow anymore, his wife or woman tells him, but the giver of good food. She will give us the warm white milk for always and always and always, and I will take care of her while you and the first friend, dog, and the first servant, horse, go hunting. Um, we just need to recognize our time on this rock is relatively short out of its total existence. We've seen wild swings and conditions over the millennia, the billennia, if that's even appropriate. Let's just look at that little bit. So if we look at that little bit that I outlined in the blue box, we got grasses theorized as origin going back almost 60 million years. We've got first grass pollen being dated again, somewhere not too much later than that, 55, 60 million. Then something happened down here in this six to eight million years ago. Something happened to drive down the CO2 level to the point where this new form of photosynthesis became favored. And so then we have this expansion of C4 grasses globally, wasn't regional, it was global, so that's interesting. Ruminants, ancestor goes back 50 million years. We have evidence of rumination and rumen flora 40 million years ago. We've got all the six families that currently exist of modern ruminants being present 20 million years ago. Does that mean that dinosaurs invented grasses? No, it doesn't quite go to... Gr- to the dinosaurs, but the origin anyway. See, because we've got this, this, this ancestor to grass here, which doesn't mean grasses. Then we've got pollen, which is necessary for it to be a grass a little later. Pretty close, though. Um, then we have this hominid ancestor about 6 million years ago, genus Homo 2.8, modern humans 0.3. There's these these... Numbers are in flux, right? But get the idea? This 
existed long before we showed up, and we showed up after this. So we had this drying climate. We had the forest retreating and the grasslands expanding. And then we had hominid ancestors that exploited that niche. Um, again, I've heard this said, we didn't evolve to eat meat. We evolved because we ate meat. Uh, and then I came across this researcher. Um, look her up on YouTube. Um, it's a great presentation, Fat of the Land, um, and I'll get these rendered as a PDF and get it posted so people can access it from social media. But um, Dr. Jess Thompson, she's now at uh, Yale. Um, so what is it that makes humans uniquely human? Some people would say language, but language kind of exists across primates. Some people say tool use, but we've got examples of other primates using tools, so that's not unique. <sighs> the fact that humans routinely take down animals their size and greater and consume them is unique among primates. Meat eating isn't unique across primates. But this idea that we're taking down large animals and they're fatty animals. And that seems to drive ingestive behavior. Um, and so this is actually a fossil of a leg bone containing fossilized bone marrow. Um, this, in her talk, she describes you know, um, um, that if Lucy, Australopithecus, um, the, the use of hammer stones is existing technology. At first, we're, they're, they're cracking open tough husks to get at a nut, right? Well, it's, we're just going to take the same tool, and now we're going to break open bones or we're going to break open skulls and access that food resource that, few other animals were utilizing in that environment. And it's also protected more so than muscle meat in the environment. So as a stage of scavenging behavior, it makes sense. She describes bone marrow as finding a stick of butter on a landscape devoid of fat, which, how was dinner, by the way? Um, so I'm going to change that last slide just a little bit. We didn't evolve to eat meat. We evolved because we ate bone marrow. And now you can combine that with the uh, expensive gut hypothesis, and now we've got this coherent explanation. And then you find, I just, I'm fascinated by stuff like this. This is coastal England. Uh, former mud flats got covered and were protected for years, so they're not exactly fossils. Um, but then they get exposed again, and so now they come in and you see these 5,000-year-old footprints here, and then red deer tracks. So I wonder why the red deer were chasing the humans. I don't <laughs> any suggestions on that. For a modern disease to be related to an old-fashioned food, red meat. It's the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard in my life, Dr. Cleave, 1973. People tried to warn against the nonsense that was coming, but they weren't listened to. So this, this evolutionary history of man domesticating animals, obviously utilizing animals, um, present day, um, we have technology available to us today that really we haven't had for certainly more than 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, managed grazing, I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, again, we can't feed today's world without ruminant animal agriculture, let alone the world of 2050. And I understand that we've got other voices coming at us, so I'm trying to just put out some information to help co combat against that. Because frankly, we have to improve our efficiency and productivity of ruminant animal agriculture, not just in North America, not just in North America and Western Europe. Globally, we need to do this. But again, we're combating... And these, there was a, there's been some really interesting papers coming out lately. I, I really hope 
that what I hope I'm seeing really is reality and not just me in wishful thinking. The notion that raising livestock and consuming animal source food, uh, in this case, he spells out milk and dairy products, meat, fish, and eggs is fundamentally incompatible with sustainable development is flawed. It's his quote. I'd use a different adjective. Refer back to MBFM. Um, Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, this, this gentleman, Adesogan, is the leader of the Livestock Innovation Laboratory, University of Florida. If, if you go to, so again, it will be on the PDF that I post. I also routinely give people, if, if they're, I direct people to papers. That's part of what I try to do. And um, his, his, if you can't read the title, Animal Source Foods, Sustainability Problem or Malnutrition and Sustainability Solution. Perspective matters. And he's from Nigeria. Okay. He also is a very large man, and he has a wonderful deep voice, and I've got voice envy. Um, <laughs> So, you know, the Earth's surface is finite. <sighs> Obviously, the majority of that's ocean. We can harvest animal source food, either aquaculture or harvest wild stocks. There are issues with both. That's not my area. If you look at cultivation, you know, the, that, that, you know, healthy whole grain and sacred soya and all those other, you know, pulses, perfect pulses that we're supposed to consume, that's got to come from less than 4% of the Earth's surface because that's all we got that's suitable for cultivation. Meanwhile, we've got 14% that's rangeland. We've got 10% that's, that's forest. We can make for, forage-based livestock systems that fit in those environments. Again, ruminants are essential for human nutrition. There's really only three things you can do to produce food. You can grow grain, oil, seed, fruit, and vegetable crops. Or you can grow pasture or range. Or you can grow forage crops, plants uh, that you intend for an animal to consume directly. So back to the kale again, right? Because you would never want to eat kale yourself. Um, <laughs> The, the products of those last two feed ruminants, cattle, sheep, goats, deer, others. From them, we get dietary sources of essential nutrition, which can go to feed us. Now, if we take those grain, oil, seed, we can feed those to humans. They're not complete sources of essential nutrition. But the thing to remember is when we do that, we produce a lot of byproduct waste. We can feed that to ruminants and upcycle it. In fact, we can feed those crops to ruminants and upcycle them. I mentioned the non-protein nitrogen before. Um, and then we've got the issue of nutrients leaving. Um, we're good at making sure that the manure gets back to the ground from the livestock. Our, our human system is pretty well broken, and really, I don't want to think about that too much. Um, livestock remove far less nutrients from the areas that they're produced in than those crops do. They're far more digestible. We need less of it to get the same amount of nutrition. We have to transfer less out of that system into the cities and then worry about what to do with it once we're done with it in the cities. Um, and in fact, over half of the world's fertilizer ends up coming from livestock. Third, almost a quarter of the nitrogen for crop yield ends up coming from manure. Even in Europe, over a third comes from livestock manures. So when we get rid of livestock agriculture, what are we going to do for the fertile? Oh, we're just going to use natural gas. No problem with that. OK. Um, you know, People will say that, think about how many people we could feed if we just stopped feeding animals grain. 
uh, well, let's look at cereal crop and already two thirds virtually of the cereal crop is going to feed humans. Maybe that's the problem. Just a thought. Ruminants in particular also consume the byproducts. I mentioned that in this one example, for every 100 pounds of human food made from a basket of food crops, 37 pounds of waste was made. Sorry, ruminant food. Eh, Matters what words we use to describe things. Um, Global ruminant um, feed, feed for animals, food for humans. It's estimated that 5 billion metric tons of dry matter are consumed by the world's ruminant, domestic ruminants. Um, I would argue that this 1% soy cakes, just because you can doesn't mean you should. (laughs) And then you've got 4% that are grains. So that's 5%. So 95% of what the global ruminants herd consumes is not human edible. And then if you drill into it some more, you find out that of that 4% figure for the grains, a quarter of that was off-grade. So it wasn't fit for human consumption. So now we're down to 96%. Kick out the soy. Oh, no, sorry. Can't, can't get away with that. And that ends up being 10% of the global cereal production is feeding the ruminants. I think that's a great deal. Again, this upcycling, we don't get milk from almonds, but we do get it from the hulls. In California, a big source of feed in their dairy systems are feeding almond hulls. Where I come from in Oregon, we got a lot of potato waste, and that goes in. In other parts of the country where you've got a fruit or vegetable, that goes into feeding ruminant animals. Value, where there's a big brewing industry, distiller's grains are a big feed resource. And again, because cattle rely on grazing and forages, they need only six-tenths of a pound or kilo of protein from human edible feed to produce one kilogram of protein in meat and milk or a pound. Right? So we're creating more f- than they're consuming. And they're increasing its quality. So when people talk about getting rid of it, so where are we going to get more of whatever it is you think you're going to replace it with, because you can't do it one for one, and where are you going to produce that? So the numbers don't work. I have beard envy in this case. (laughs) When our soils are gone, we too must go unless we find some way to feed on raw rock. Uh, Erosion is a major issue in the United States as well as globally, and we've made a lot of progress. So imagine removing six inches of soil from an area the size of Kentucky every year. And it takes thousands of years to make an inch from parent material. And tillage, which is some degree is required for producing annual crops, necessarily degrades soil quality. We can do things to minimize it, but producing more crops when all our really best land is already in production, so you're talking about using more land, which is the more marginal land, which is more susceptible to this. You see the, okay. <clears throat> I'll talk more about this tomorrow. Uh, this is just a demonstration of uh, infiltration. So it's a rainfall simulator. You've got an oscillating sprinkler just out of the top of the frame. Okay, you've got four different sod, sod soil surfaces that they've collected and put in these trays, and then these trays are designed to catch whatever runs off and drop it into the jug. And so we have four different ones: a clean till, conventional field, no residue, minimal residue, overgrazed pasture well-managed pasture, and then something called cover crop. There's a big effort now 
in getting people to realize we need to keep something green and growing on that soil for as much of the year as possible, even if we're growing an annual crop. And again, I'll talk about that tomorrow. <clears throat> the point here is that in the time it took to get to gather a gallon of sediment laden water off of both the convent, the clean till and the overgrazed pasture, we got nothing running off of the well managed pasture. We got a third of a gallon coming off and it's a little lighter. So this is better than this, but Nothing's as good as well-managed pasture in terms of increasing infiltration, reducing runoff, reducing sedimentation into surface water, okay? But it's got to be well-managed. Uh, just because you put a fence around it, don't make it a pasture. <laughs> Anybody says we need to be, you know, plant-based diet, my answer is humanity's diet's already plant-based. And maybe that's the problem. The majority of our calories are coming from plant sources. The majority of humanity's protein is coming from plant sources. Uh, those are both problems. We sh this should not be controversial, but in some audiences it is, remarkably so. Um, if I take equal numbers of calories, properly measured, <laughs> I'll get to that. Um, from plant sources and animal sources, they don't have the same metabolic effect on the human you're feeding. If I, take, if I take equal amounts of protein and minerals from plant sources and animal sources, they don't have the same metabolic effect on the human being I'm feeding. <clears throat> Vitamins, the requirement for vitamin is to, driven by diet. It's not a fixed amount. <clears throat> plant source foods may, in fact, not be required at all. That's controversial, so we'll just leave it there. <clears throat> But understand that when they talk about footprint of agricultural systems, they consider the food coming out equivalent, plant to animal. So why don't we do an accurate quality assessment? And when we do, we find out that the animal systems are right in ballpark with the plant systems. And now we're just looking at protein in this case. Nobody eats just protein. Right? We get a whole package of nutrition that comes along with the protein. So we've had these kinds of things thrown at us for a while, but we just need to learn how to deconstruct them. Um, <clears throat> we're getting closer to something that I promised to talk about now for a while. <clears throat> the poorest 20% <clears throat> of the tropical population around the world, rice provides more protein per person than beans, meat, or milk. And rice sucks as a protein source. <clears throat> That's a technical term, by the way. <clears throat> First of all, it's only 9% crude protein. <clears throat> the diass value for lysine is only 64%. The lysine content is 3 tenths of a percent. Compare that to beef. If you're not familiar with diass, please look it up. Um, digestible indispensable amino acid score. Uh, just because the amino acid is in a food doesn't mean it's digestible. And we need amino acids. We don't need crude protein. <clears throat> I like people to compare and contrast animal husbandry with human husbandry. <laughs> Certainly since the 70s. Uh, for almost four decades, swine nutritionists have known and cared more about essential amino acids in the diets they prescribe than their human nutrition counterparts. Oh, I'm almost there. Less than 40% of the protein in our food supply is coming from animal sources. And again, that's the problem. More protein comes from cereals in humanity's diet. And, and the Einsteins that produced Eat Lancet say we should get more of that. We don't get anything negative with cereals, do we? No? No, it's all good? Um, so this is per capita protein supply comparing 1961 to 2013 by five different regions and then the world total. 
Uh, the bottom bar that's labeled is grams per person per day of animal source protein. So the next time somebody says we're eating too much, what planet is that occurring on? And then the other thing is they're listing this as if it's equivalent to this. And plant source protein is in no way equivalent to animal source protein. So I'm going to scale those down by a figure that I can justify. And we begin to see what the real number might look like. <clears throat> and this is where the Eat Lancet proposed that our intake level be from animal source food. Somebody said when it was established that they were saying seven grams, you know, it's like, well, I just flossed seven grams out from my teeth. What? Um, so, so slight digestion, I mean digression. Um, cru when you see protein listed on a food table or on a label, please understand that that is a crude protein value. The way that's determined and has been since 1860s when proximate analysis was first published is you determine the total nitrogen percentage in that sample and you multiply that one number by 6.25 because you assume that all the protein that you found was in, sorry, all the nitrogen that you found was in protein and all that protein was 16% nitrogen. Well, that's okay with animal sources, okay but it's not good with plants because plants contain a lot of nitrogenous compounds that aren't protein. And again, we need amino acids, but we're still stuck in this antiquated system. We've been so distracted by these other stories. We haven't done the work that could have actually made... Okay, get... Sorry. All right. That rant's over for a while. Um... Somebody tell me, how many calories per gram of carbohydrate? That's fat. Sawdust. Well, okay, that's what happens if you burn it completely in a bomb calorimeter. But how much of that is metabolizable? How much of that could we actually use? Well, in animal science, we've been doing this for decades. Yeah, same total value, gross energy, down metabolizable, maybe less than half, with something good like alfalfa hay for a ruminant. The calories listed in all your tables and on all your labels are gross energy calories. This is mind-blowing. Okay, so ruminants get their carbohydrates from gluconeogenesis. Don't want to spend too much time. We're all cattle. We have about 9% of the world's beef animals in the United States. We produce about 19% of the world's beef. So as we look around the world, there are obviously countries that have a great deal more cattle, but they're relatively less productive. So if we really want to make an impact on animal impact, increasing efficiency is a way to do that. Um, concentrate feed use if you want to look at the specific um, species that, that we're feeding. Um, but at the end of the day, only 1% of the global cattle are on feed. And those are a handful of countries. But let's make sure we understand what's going on here. For the first six to 10 months, we've got cattle that are running on pasture. Those cattle are then weaned. They can go into a stalker or a backgrounding operation. They could stay on pasture or they could go into a lot. It depends on the economy. It depends on the location. It depends on a lot of things. Um, grass finishing six to 10 months, grain finishing four to six months. So 
How many times have I stood in front of an audience and had somebody think that cattle in a feed yard, that the, the beef animals spend their entire life in a cage, let alone a pen, let alone what actually happens. And um, why did that not happen? Um, and even in a feed yard, even on feed, they don't just eat corn. So this is the ration that they would eat when they first come in, and this is the ration that they eat at the end of that four-month, five-month finishing phase. And again, whatever we're feeding them ends up being improved as far as feed quality goes. And total production system life cycle feed required for an average North American grain finished feedlot steer were still less than 10% of that being grain on a life cycle basis. And if we then start to look at, well, how much meat was produced from the edible grain that was fed, now we start finding cattle falling right in line with swine and poultry. That 10 to 1 thing, they're looking at the total ration, but we've already established that most of that's not human utilizable, so why are we talking about that? No, we're not going to restart. Uh, okay, so what's the future? This is the future. We know we've got a growing and growingly prosperous population. We know that that's going to call for an increase in food production, doubling. We know it's going to come with an increased demand for animal source food by about two-thirds. We know we're not making any more land. In fact, we're losing it. So how are we going to do this? Well, part of this is going to be addressing the 40% of food that gets produced that never gets eaten, right? So that's a big part of this. But coincidentally or not, meat is one of the products that has the lowest waste. And the others that we're told we need to eat more of, the fresh fruits and veggies, that's the highest waste. So how does that balance out? Um, and again, this is today. Less than one-third are well-fed and malnourished, according to their definition, and I would push back a little bit. Um, but 11% of GDP is lost annually in Africa and Asia from poor nutrition due to stunting. Cognitive impairment lasts a lifetime, right? If you miss critical periods of brain development, you can't make that up later. And then health care for obesity, economic costs, they have a $2 trillion I'm going to push hard on that because I've got a study that pegs the obesity disease, the dis obesity related diseases in the United States direct indirect cost at one one point seven five trillion just in the U.S. equivalent to nine point three percent of GDP. All of farm and ranch gate values one percent. That's an idea of the magnitude here. So. Um, th this is sustainable development goals. This is work FAO. Others are trying to drive toward, you know, here's, here's your almost a quarter of children globally under five being stunted. Here's a third of women of childbearing age being anemic globally. At the same time, we've got an amount of wasting. We've also got childhood overweight global and obesity in adults. Unfortunately, these people are using a wrong paradigm to address this. They're talking about overeating, sedentary behavior, too much animal source food. Um, I'm trying to get them to start to include, thank you, metabolic illness. And if we could get them to incorporate metabolic syndrome, we would address all these issues. It's hard to find estimates. One estimate that says 25%, well, that's based on the amount of diabetes times three. That's one citation. And then another citation gave me over 50%. So clearly, it's a huge problem. <clears throat> you can plot childhood stunting against meat consumption by country. And yeah, you know, it's an association. But dang, it's pretty good. Um, 
as you get down below. You start to have this expansion. Oh, by the way, where did Eat Lancet want us to be? Oh, that's interesting. No, thank you. And of course, they're going to use their environmental impact here, right? So another take-home lesson is it's not farts, it's belches. And the fact that people are still talking about cow farts indicates the quality of the understanding of the issue, right? But let's just acknowledge that ruminants aren't alchemists. They're not creating this. They're cycling. So CO2 in the atmosphere is fixed via photosynthesis into carbohydrate. The animal ingests some portion of that, and then some portion of that ends up being reduced to methane and burped out. In the atmosphere, it's, redu it's oxidized back to CO2 in about 10 years. So it's a cycling of CO2, as opposed to burning fossil fuels, which represents an enrichment of CO2 in the atmosphere. Somebody starts bloviating about how cattle produce more than transportation. The figures are all of, all of agriculture in the United States is 9%. Livestock is 4%, which means that plant agriculture produces more than livestock agriculture. This includes the feed necessary to feed the livestock. And then 2% is the beef industry, some, something on that order. Then you've got transportation at 28%, equal to electricity industry, 22%. Those are the numbers. If you want to look at just methane and you want to look at this globally, this is the methane that comes out of the ruminants. And you see the level for the United States from 1961 to 2013, this startling rise in enteric methane emissions. No, the green line, right, level. Okay, industrial, took them a while to kind of catch on. They've been coming down. It's the developing world that's increasing. And there's things that we can do. We can reduce that by 30%. We have the technology. We just need to understand that that's what we need to do. If we look at the global, it's 14.5%. Make sure that people aren't using a global number for the U.S., <clears throat> Make sure that they don't give all that global number just to cattle, because cattle are only 6%. The, the beef is 6% of the global total, not the 14 and a half. And the U.S. beef cattle production is less than a half of a percent of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Okay? And again, 8% of the global beef cattle emissions are from the U.S., but again, that's producing 19% of the world's beef. So that's efficiency. Right? And this is where it just gets truly weird. If I doubled average consumption of beef in the United States on a life cycle basis, that emission would be worth, would be less than the tailpipe emissions from a car traveling 2,700 miles that gets 25 miles per gallon or flying round trip JFK to LAX via Denver. That, and that's just tailpipe. That's just the fuel coming out of the tailpipe here compared to the life cycle for the beef. We're not even, it, it can't be we're having an honest conversation because the numbers just aren't there. Okay, what happens if we got rid of all animal agriculture and that includes pets? There's nine and a half there's 9 million dairy cows in the United States. There's 9.5 million horses. They never talk about the horses. <laughs> Wonder why that might be. Hurt fundraising much? Yes. They'll, they'll get there. Don't worry. Okay, so if we got rid of all of them. Oh, and by the way, the animals don't get to hang around. <laughs> right? So after the world's largest barbecue... <laughs> We're going to have costs, so we're going to have benefits. The potential benefit is that we're going to, this model predicted a decrease of 2.6% global greenhouse gas emissions and 0.36% U.S. If U.S. eliminated livestock agriculture. 
but it would come at a cost, unbalanced food ecosystem, creation of essential dietary nutrient deficiencies. Yeah, doesn't sound good to me. Um, one study, Upper Midwest, they compared under specific grazing management, and again, protocols. They did this on former crop ground, <clears throat> looked at four years of data of the carbon, soil carbon increase. <clears throat> they compared a feedlot finishing to a grass finishing under this grazing system. What they found was the feedlot operation produced lower emissions than the adaptive multi-paddock grazing system. That's biology. That's how a, digestious, a ruminant digestion system works. <clears throat> but the adaptive multi-paddock grazing sequestered large amounts of soil carbon, and it was enough to offset what was emitted in that grass finishing phase. So now let me back up point out, number one, this was on previously cropped ground. The organic matter had been depleted. So it will take a while for that soil to get back up to a new equilibrium. So it won't just continue to increase. All right. So at some point, that's going to change. Number two is <laughs> they're just looking at the finishing phase. What about the cow-calf phase? What about the stalker phase? Why don't we put it all together and look, we're getting real close to being able to say that this system is carbon neutral to negative, regardless of how they get finished. Okay, we're, 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 we're trundling down here to the end. Thank you for your patience. Um, pharmaceutical industry's gotten a pass in all this. And I'm, the pharmaceutical industry has gotten a pass in this conversation about livestock impact, okay? But again, these people have a worldview and a mindset. This, this is an example of that. Half the people worldwide who need insulin to treat type 2 diabetes will not receive it in 2030 unless access is improved. Only there were some demonstrably proven lifestyle intervention that could reduce type 2 diabetics' need for insulin. If only. What could it possibly be? What might do that? Turns out that the pharma industry, on average, is a higher intensity emitter than the automotive industry. Greenhouse gas impact of moving to a lower meat diet is offset by pharmaceutical use. If the average American type 2 diabetic could eliminate their medication use, they'd reduce their carbon footprint 29% more than if they switched from a meat heavy to a vegan diet. If only there were some way. <laughs> only there were some way that's been demonstrated where medication use was reduced in a remarkably short period of time for diabetics, type 2. This is too low. Hmm? The insulin is too low. I mean, they, they can only see medication as the answer. Because it kills people. That's why it's so toxic. It kills well, insulin kills people, yeah. period, regardless of where it comes from. Yeah. Too much insulin is bad for you. Um, 5% of all traffic is now caused by the National Health Service in England. That, that's traffic that's tied to people going to appointments or supplies being delivered or, right? See, again, the health system, so-called health care, has gotten a pass in this. Both professions wear white coats, which produces more greenhouse gases. Well, I already told you that U.S. agriculture, animal agriculture is 4%, beef is 2%, health care is 10%. Now, fairness forces me to say, compels me to say, these are not similar comparisons. These are lifestyle, <laughs> lifestyle. These are life cycle figures, and this is a different analysis. So this is looking at everything it took to produce beef. Over here, you have energy use, 
you'd have food use, you'd have other things flowing into this that probably have already been accounted in another. But the point is, it has a presence and an impact, and we're not looking at it. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm happy with the 10% figure. It could be larger. I mean, every 30 seconds, someone in the world loses a lower leg due to diabetes. This is a global issue. Um, and, you know, imagine what that does in some countries and communities. I mean, that's... Uh, and, in fact, we now know that when people start down that progressive amputation route, their prognosis, it, their life expectancy is shorter than many forms of cancer following diagnosis. And then we've got the whole relationship between cancer and hyperinsulinemia, so the whole thing. Um, if we're going to look at meat as a dietary choice, and we're going to say, but what about the environmental impact? I'm going to say, but on the other end, we have to look at health ramifications. Because currently, it's entirely informed by conventional wisdom. The assumption is we should be eating less meat because it's bad for you to eat meat. And it's bad for the planet, so of course we should eat less meat. Not so fast, my friend. Um, I mentioned earlier, this, this, there's a group of papers that came out in this journal called Animal Frontiers. It was last, um, October, last month's issue, the entire issue, looking at these sorts of questions. Protein and muscle health during aging, benefits and concerns related to animal-based protein. Okay, the title should have been a clue. <laughs> Here are the three statements. Individuals aged at least 65, fast-growing segment, mentioned that earlier, growing population is going to be people that get to live longer. So when they say two-third increase in demand for animal source food, the FAO, they didn't account for this. Uh, so it's probably going to be more. Age-related muscle uh, mass, loss of muscle mass and strength is a significant problem. Increasing the ratio of animal-based protein relative to plant-based protein in the diet may help to mitigate. Okay, then we start getting things like this. Animal-based protein sources, especially those that are lean or nutrient-dense, <laughs> are the most anabolic per gram. Well... You're talking about protein per gram, grams of protein. You're talking about lean, nutrient-dense is officially defined as explicitly low-fat because, again, they don't consider fat a nutrient. So it's present, even natural fat, right? We're not talking added fats talking the fats that come in meat, can only dilute the essential nutrients that they see in there. Yeah, it's, so that's what I mean about be sure you know what they're talking about. And then this one just gives them away. Additional health and environmental considerations are needed prior to increasing animal-based protein intake recommendations in the United States and globally. And I would merely ask, well, why now? Why why? You, you restricted, somebody restricted them before without any evidence, without any data. People tried to warn you and you busted. So why, why do we on the animal science side feel like we have to give deference to this concept about too much and, and the myths of chronic disease being due to too much? Um, economic value, U.S. beef, they're trying to look at values to society and this is something that you see frequently come up in the greenhouse gas emission conversation. The social cost of carbon is a concept that comes up. Well, but there's many ecosystem services. For example, if you don't graze grassland, it becomes a fire source, right? So properly managing that, watershed enhancement, wildlife benefits, all this kind of thing, they come together. And they, they give a total, and then they subtract something for the cost of carbon, which they, they, they put at 49 cents. So they come up with a 37 cents per pound of beef benefit to society, not compensated to the grower. And this is before we've ever addressed anything to do with that $1.75 trillion cost of, I think that number's going to go up. 
think that number is going to go up a hell of a lot, but we have to do the work to make that happen, so I'm trying to do that. Um, so review, humans are heterotrophs, we have to eat something. Something's got to die if we're going to live animal products, superior sources of nutrition in the human diet. Ruminant animal agriculture offers unique ecological advantages over other forms of food production. There can be no sustainable agriculture without ruminants. Ruminants are not competing with humans for resources. In fact, they increase the quantity and quality of humanity's food supply. Uh, for specific points, animal protein is superior to plant protein and human nutrition. Fats from animal products, especially from ruminants, are beneficial, while polyunsaturated fatty acids from plants have been shown to be harmful. Minerals are more bioavailable from animal source foods, providing essential nutrients unavailable from plant source foods. The only viable source of B12 for human diet is animal source food. At some point, since the divergence between the ancestor to chimp and ancestor to us, you know, that branch point, some point after that, our ancestor lost the ability to absorb B12 from their large intestine that was produced by the microorganisms living there. Chimps can still do that. Now, that should have been fatal to us because you have to have B12. But apparently, our ancestors were eating an animal source food rich diet, providing sufficient B12 from what they were already eating. And there are other examples of other nutrients like that where we've lost the ability to synthesize, but apparently it wasn't fatal to us because we're still here. Um, modern humans exist because of ruminants. Modern societies depend upon them. They will be essential to the future of humanity. Estimates of ruminant animal agriculture's environmental impact are typically overstated, oversimplified, and misleading. And that's the politest description I could give other than referring back to male bovine fecal matter. So I am not a medical doctor. I don't give medical advice. I'm happy to help people find resources so that they can have informed conversations with their medical providers. I'm happy to have the conversation. I thank you for your patience and your attention. And if you want to reach me, um, I'm available. If anybody's familiar with Nova Scotia, there really is a place called Meat Cove. And yes, I knew I was going there, so I made sure I had a tripod packed so I could, because I was traveling by myself. Um, and questions are, are welcome. Um, we've got a bit of time left in this section. <clears throat> so again, thank you for coming. Thank you for your attention. Did everyone hear that question? Should I try to repeat? Okay. Oh, thank you. Good point. Um, so basically, you're re relating information about how um, seasonal forage would produce differing quality of feed in the case of milk. Um, <clears throat> no, that's, that's a real thing. Um, in most systems you've got a couple things going for you. One is in less modern systems, we're still very synchronized with the season. So you would, and, and not necessarily just modern versus not. There are a number of very modern grazing economies that the dairy, for example, is synchronized to the season. So all the animals calve at the same time. In the United States, they tend to be sort of continuous milk supply. The cow doesn't milk all year long, but you have calves being produced. Okay. So you, there, there is the concern. It's part of management. We can detect differences, but then we have to wonder about the biological significance of those differences. And for this, I'm thinking primarily of the omega-6, omega-3 issue. 
um, in terms of other vitamins and things. Again, <clears throat> vitamin need isn't static, and it can be influenced by other things. So it's varying feed supply is an issue, and then what comes out of that system. But in terms of meat, I would think less than milk because milk is a much more rapid influence on the product. Uh, there was one in the back, and then we'll come up here. Sir? Um, so yeah, so uh, again, the, the, the question of eating grain is unnatural, and so cows shouldn't eat grain. Is that a fair? Okay. So, so no, they shouldn't eat too much grain. Um, you've got, again, a need for both structural and non-structural carbohydrate in the ration of the animal. And it's a matter of balance. If you get that balance wrong, you can shift the pH of the rumen. You can do that in stages so that at first it's a mild subacute condition, but that subacute condition can manifest as lameness, reproductive problems, liver abscesses. Those conditions are there, and management is about not producing those. Um, a large amount of antibiotic use is not about that. There is a class that is. So it isn't a necessary thing that grain is poisonous to ruminants. Too much, not good. But too much for us isn't good either. So, so, so I, I, the, my takeaway from that is emphasizing the complete use of the animal and um, again some people get involved in this and it's like well I can't afford steak I mean I had this conversation with a young faculty member and it's like I'm not saying you have to eat steak I mean uh, um, well exactly I mean I, I don't know if people are familiar with Ted Naiman um, and he's told this story so it's not breaking any confidence but he had he works for a not-for-profit outside Seattle as a physician, so he takes whatever time, and he's not much worried about the business sort of stuff. It's a great gig. Um, and he had a gentleman who was homeless living in a tent. Yes, I'd like to know the rest of that story, but it's who comes in. And so he has the conversation with him. The man goes to a second-hand store. He buys a cast-iron skillet. He cooks on a butane stove. He goes to Safeway. He buys the cheap 80-20 hamburger. He buys the cheapest eggs that are available because that's what he can afford. And in a year's time, I know it was less, but I'll say a year, he dumped 70 pounds of excess body fat, not weight, fat, and he normalized all his blood markers. And he's spending $6 a day for food and fuel. So... Yes, exactly right. We, we, we need to find ways. Uh, that, that picture of me on my hands and knees in the chicory field. Um, I had a different picture of dairy cows on it when I first made it. And it was a picture of a bunch of Jersey cows, which are really cute. And they were all lined up in their stanchions. And they were all looking at me because they're very curious. But if you're not from a dairy, if you have no background, would you understand that they were free to put their heads through and free to pull their heads back? Or would you assume that they spend their entire life locked up in a head gate? Right? I mean, it's, it's the average American today is more likely to have direct personal experience with the criminal justice system than with production agriculture. Yeah, there's a lot wrong with that. Um, I heard that at a conference, and I said, okay, let me write that down, because I want to make sure I remember it. Now let me check it, because I want to make sure. So I found statistics from Department of Justice, and I found statistics from USDA Census of Ag. I think it was 2012 and 2013. At that time, we had 2 million people listed as Census of Ag, primary operators of farms, 2 million. At that time, we had 2.1 million people locked up, local, state, federal. Not parole, not probation, not done your time and welcome back. No, no. At that time, locked up. And then some, I said that at a 
conference and a rancher said, Pete, what does it take to be called a farmer? A farm. Oh, you have to sell a thousand dollars and you're a farm. Now, that's a good hobby and I'm all for you. But you drill into that number and you find that <laughs> 70 plus percent of that two million made less than a quarter of their household income from the farm. So now we're down to 500,000. So, and, and then that picture got me in trouble up in Canada because the head of the human nutrition department saw a picture of me on my hands and knees and said, well, he can't be serious. <laughs> so, I mean, there's only so much of this you can do, you know, to try to think through this. I mean, that one just like, really? That was your excuse, right? Uh, so... But that, that point of, efficient, of, of extensive utilization. Um, and then what other ways can we reach people who are only coming with what they've been told, right? I mean, and how, do we, how do we do that in a way that doesn't lock people into where they are, how, all of that? So there was another question here, and then... Thank you. So I'm on the right path. Uh, Amber O'Hearn, I don't think she came up with this, but she's used, it's eat meat, mostly fat, not too little. Is, <laughs> is her vision, version of that. Oh. Uh, I had a question about cheese. Organic Valley Company produces a grass milk cheese now. Does that have, does the cheese have more omega-3s, uh, better ratio of omega-3 to 6 than regular cheese? Is that I would assume there has to be if it's on the label. I mean, we, we can't make claims. Okay. Um, I have no trouble believing that. Um, and if, you know, you prefer that product and, and you can afford it, um, then please support them. Um, on the other hand, I don't think that that would be necessary to produce the kind of health benefits that we've been seeing in other approaches. The, there's here, and then there's two that I'll go through real quick. I was wondering if you could address wild animal belches. Um, I'm huh. assuming that most people wouldn't really support the idea of killing all the wild animals. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. They, they, they've had kangaroo kills and things in the name of protecting the environment. So, I mean, they've gone there. Um, others have done other things, killing wildlife. No, um, again, the conversation has been constrained to only look at man influences. And so anything that falls outside of that is not part of the conversation. Now, we have far more livestock than we have wild animals. That, that's a reality. But termites are a significant source of methane. Um, so that's an issue. There was another thought that, uh, oh, I know. It's, it's similar to the whole um, carcin um, carcinogen issue. The legislation... <laughs> The regulation is entirely around man-made compounds. And I think the figure goes something like 99.99% of by weight of all the carcinogens we're exposed to in our diet are naturally occurring pesticides that the plants produce, that we consume. Now, again, they're natural, so they're not part of the testing protocol. And the testing protocol is we get this strain of test rodent that's selected to be very susceptible to cancer, and then we give it massive doses. And the way the legislation is written is if any animal uh, gets cancer at any dose of this substance, it's a carcinogen for humans. That's the assumption. So we have, we have carcinogens that produce cancer in mice but not rats and in males but not female mice. Doesn't matter the way it's written. Okay, so these natural compounds which are not tested by and large, 50 some of them have been and 27 turn out to be carcinogenic by that system, but they're natural. So I'm not saying worry about them, 
But I'm just trying to say that's kind of, again, part of the reality of what we're looking at, um, if that made sense. Um, this again, this, this, these are omega-6 to omega-3 ratio figures. It's a mixture of data. Um, these two, the grass-fed beef and the grain-fed beef, came from a research trial. Then Dr. Duckett from Clemson University went to the grocery store and bought the other four products and analyzed them in her lab to determine omega-6 to omega-3. Adele Height dropped in the soybean oil. So it's a product of looking at it. So people get very concerned about four to one or some number, and I'm okay, you make your choices, but if that's the case, then don't be eating out here. And again, one of the benefits of a ruminant is its flesh will always be less influenced by its diet than will monogastrics because of all those processes I tried to describe, that microbial, anaerobic, it's just like it, it's, it's an organic deconstruction chamber where stuff gets pulled apart and reassembled. Just one thing, and then I'll get to you. Oh, this is not what I wanted. Oh, yeah. Okay. So th this is this mythical four to, sorry, did I say that? This is the four to one that comes from us, comes to us from Harvard which as far as I'm concerned is reason enough to be skeptical. Um, you got to look at what you're actually getting, not the ratio. So now we start to look at actual quantity. Here's your, these are the same two, right? That were in the previous, All right? So you see, those two are the same, All right? And so are these, right? This is the same. Some fish got dropped in here. Here's your chicken thigh. That's the same one we saw before. Tofu got added. Walnuts got added. Note the scale had to get broken. And then remember that most of these count plant omegas, threes, and animal omega threes together as if they're the same and they take the plant omega-6s and the animal omega-6s and count them together as if they're the same, just like they used to count iron as if it was the same, regardless of whether it came from heme or elemental filings that they put in the product. I mean, so all of this kind of stuff, again, it, it matters. And at the end of the day, how much of this whole story was driven by we found one more population that eats a lot of fat and doesn't have heart disease? What could it possibly be? Oh, it must be the fish oil. The irony, of course, is most of their fat in that population wasn't coming from fish. It was coming from mammals, either caribou or marine mammals. But such was the quality of the re But it did spawn a fish oil industry, so there's that. Okay, was there another? You had a question, sir. Um, yeah, so I had a two-year question, I guess I'll... Uh, <laughs> um, so you said that we could use technology to reduce the methane. Yes. Emissions of cows. But what if, like, that methane emission be part of the natural carbon cycle of rodents? And, like, where does methane yeah. Well, well, so I, I don't see a major problem, you know, globally interrupting that cycle. Oh, uh, so there's like enough carbon out there that like the cycle will not be interrupted. You, well, yeah. So how do I put this? Um, we're we're currently at what 400 parts per million kind of thing, and um, but we're still at a point where that's low enough to limit plant growth. So if you go into greenhouse operation growing tomatoes, they'll jack it to 1,000. There's a reason they do that. Um, I'm not saying we should do that, but okay, that's where we are. So it, it, talking about carbon, uh, carbon dioxide or Well, carbon dioxide, I'm sorry. Yes, good point, good point. I was getting, getting things mixed. Um, so, but, but the methane is going to get back to CO2 quickly. Um, and so, sorry, that's an excellent point. Um, the, the biggest point with the methane emissions, 
is a significant number of those cows that we're seeing aren't productive. They're not giving much milk or they're not giving a calf reliably. They're just there. So a whole lot of what we've got to do is assemble teams of people. It, it's, it, it, I can't just grab, you know, Animal Science 101 and Forages 201, climb on a plane, go over and say, there you are, you're done. Um, in some of those communities where they're trying to do that one egg a day intervention, they've got to find ways to empower the woman to not sell every egg that she's got. Right, so she's got, so there's, there's that sort of sociological, psychological thing going on. There's got to be cultural sensitivity. I, I was at a summit, and I think there was a guy from Alberta and a guy from Oklahoma and somebody from Ireland and a guy from Zimbabwe, and they're all cattlemen. <clears throat> and so the, you know, the two guys from North America were like, you know, I'm fourth generation cattleman. And the guy from Ireland is like, I'm fifth generation. Guy from Zimbabwe goes, yeah, I think I'm about 25th generation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, point taken. You've been doing this for a long time. It's your culture is steeped in this. When your wealth is indicated by the number of animals that you have, now start talking about culling the unproductive ones because that makes no sense. Right? Why, no, why, why would I you know, talk to them about castrating males that you don't want breeding because they're not good genetics? Oh, that's crazy. You, you don't do that because the bull is more valuable than the steer. Well, but then you just end up with a polyglot of bulls that are beating up on each other and wearing out the cows. You're making no advancement. It's, it's just this, these inefficiencies that can be addressed. Then there's others that I heard. Apparently in Nepal, their dairy is based on buffalo, not bison, buffalo. And they launched a program. And again, this is just not fancy stuff. You just got to figure out how to do it right. They, they just delivered to them dry cow treatment. You know, just came up with a program to educate them about how to treat your dry cows because they had this massive problem with mastitis infections. They took the rate of infection from 75% to less than 15. So now you need fewer animals because you're not having to replace all those. Now you have better animal welfare because they're not suffering. Now you need less antibiotic. Now you have more profit for the... All those things accrued, and it's just stuff we know how to do. But we need, we need people like Bill Gates. And he, in fairness, he's, he's one of the funders of some of this. So that's come up with someone else. We need people in private world who see the need for what I call a ruminant revolution, right? To, to, to get this information appropriately transferred to increase productivity and efficiency globally. You know, it takes us less than two years to produce a slaughter steer. In Brazil, you can easily see this year's calf and last year's calf and the calf before it still on the cow. And that's just, you know, so, and, and now you can talk about quality of the meat and all kinds of other issues. So that's, and, and then at the end, methane is a loss. So that's energy that wasn't, ca so some of the things that can be done would actually allow the animal to capture more of feed energy if we could reduce some of those emissions. It may have to do with um, things like feed quality because the higher the digestibility of the fiber going in, the less the emissions. No, you're not going to update. Stop it. <laughs> Just go away. Yes, ma'am. Could you give us a little hint of what you're going to talk about tomorrow? Um, I'm going to talk more about soil health. I'm going to talk about the difference between perennial and annual. I'm going to talk more <laughs> about the carbon cycle, the water cycle. Um, and, and global sort of implications. Some of this has got to come back around again because not everybody, you know, but I'll try to not plow the same ground. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Couldn't help myself.
well, again, I'm going to push back and say, what level of calorie? Are you just talking? Oh, I, I agree. Are you just talking about gross energy, in which case we should grow wood? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Okay. With no, no, I'm serious. And I, I think I understand where you're driving at. And what I would say is we have a better chance of doing it with animal only than we do with no animals because we can't. So, again, this is one of the things I know I'll talk about tomorrow. It's not either or. Globally, livestock are integrated into agriculture. Like the majority of the cereals produced in the world are produced on farms where the livestock are part of the operation. They're mixed operations. Um, in the United States and other parts of the world for reasons that, okay, we could talk about, we've seen this separation of a specialization on individual enterprises, but then we also see that that's still integrated so that the almonds produce hulls that go to, you know, so it, it's still integrated, but not in the same operation where in other parts of the world it is. So it's, it's just not possible to have agriculture without animals. And then the question of could we, you know, well, again, we've got 9% of the world's beef animals, and we produce 19% of the world's beef. So if we could appropriately improve the productivity of the rest of the world, that would gain us a heck of a lot. Then we look at um, places like the southeastern U.S., which has a tremendous amount of potential. I talked to a guy there. He says, could easily increase productivity of southeastern U.S. pastures by 50%, just doing what we know how to do. Don't need any new technology. Don't need it. Okay, 50%. That's what he said. Then he said, we could increase the amount of pasture in the southeast by 50% without taking out any cropland or any forest because we got so much land that's idle. It's reverting. There's like 3 million acres in New York State alone. I just came out of Atlantic Canada. Okay, this is the land that ancestors cleared, and it's now reverting to scrub, and it's not productive. Uh, in some places, they pay people to come in. So I'm driving around in October, and I'm seeing hay bales out, and it's like, what the heck is that about? It's like, well, it's not hay. They paid somebody to come in to cut it, to hay it, to keep the wild rose and other woody species from encroaching. And I'm going, now, most of your young people are leaving this region to find work. This is some of the best cool season grass growing ground I've seen. And wouldn't it be possible that somebody would pay you to bring your animals onto their land to graze it instead of haying it? They're paying for haying. Because you could make the case that you'd improve it. And then you've got a product. I mean, I forget what percent of their provincial budget is going for this health issue. I mean, it's massive. So you start to see things like this, and you start going through this exercise, and you realize we haven't begun to tap this. So, yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky exercise to walk through. But part of it is we have to recognize that, that thing that I mentioned about we, we have to get that we're, we should not treat plant source foods and animal source foods on equivalent basis, whether it's protein or minerals or energy or what is it? I mean, it's just, it's going to produce different results in the humans you're feeding. That's going to have downstream effects. I mean, if, if protein actually ends up modifying or, or influencing ingestive behavior, and there's good evidence that it does, and there's good evidence that we'll keep eating until we get the, pro the essential amino acids that we need. And if we're eating a poor quality diet with a lot of carbohydrate, maybe that contributes to the whole problem, not the whole thing, but a part of it. And we've got this literature. And again, I, I, I think the world of Ted Naiman, I'm concerned about the protein leveraging hypothesis because I think the protein data is confounded because they treat all the protein the same. And I think the energy 
data is confounded because they treat all those calories the same. I mean, they're going to the book and they're pulling values, and I know what those values are. They're, it's just, yes, ma'am. Uh, trying. I'm, I'm, I'm open to suggestions and, and finding a better way to do that. Um, and, and it's not, it can't be just private. It's got to be public as well. But yeah, we need to find a way to, to get more people aware of this. So I welcome input. I think that's it. Thank you. I'm, I'm here throughout tomorrow, so um, que you know, grab me gently for questions or conversations. Thank you. Thanks again for coming. Thank you.